So as a musician, standing waves are my favorite sort of wave. Um, these are the waves that musical instruments use. Um, so first, how do we make a standing wave? So we've talked in class about traveling waves. So those are waves that are moving forward, right? Um, to make a standing wave, what you do is when you say pluck a guitar string, it's going to send um, a, a traveling wave, an incoming wave, going maybe this way. It'll bounce off some end, maybe the end of the guitar string where it's fixed. It'll send a reflected wave back the other way. So that wave is going this way. Um, those are two waves on the same string, and so they're going to interfere with each other constructively and destructively um, to make a single wave. Um, what that wave looks like um, is everywhere where the incoming wave and the reflected wave are the same distance above and below equilibrium. So say like right here. Notice how the incoming wave is the same distance above equilibrium as the reflected wave is below equilibrium. That's going to cause destructive interference right there and they will completely cancel each other out. So as a, the incoming wave is this way, reflected wave is this way, they cancel out and you get nothing right there, no wave at all. That happens again, so these are a few, happen in a few places, there's one there, around, maybe around here, um, maybe around here you get another one. Um, this, this drawing is like not, not quite perfect here, it's a little bit off scale. Um, there's also places where you see constructive interference, so say like right here, both the incoming and the reflected wave are above equilibrium, so they're going to add on top of each other and make an even taller wave. Or here, they're both below equilibrium, so they'll add on top of each other negatively and make an even deeper trough. Same idea here. So those are constructive interference spots. Um, when we add all this together, what we get is another wave, but this wave is a little bit different from either of the traveling waves, the red traveling wave or the blue traveling wave, in that it's standing still. So um, we're going to look at an animation of this in class because it's really hard for me to act out, um, but essentially this wave is just going like this, like just going up and down. Um, it's not actually moving forwards and backwards like a regular traveling wave would do. So here's another illustration of it. Um, you can see the rope is just vibrating up and down, um, and these places of destructive interference stay destructive interference all the time. The rope actually never moves there. They have a special name. Those are called nodes, and those are points of zero amplitude. So that's where your incoming wave and your reflected wave will actually always cancel out. We'll show in an animation in class how that happens for all time. Even as the waves move past each other, they continue to completely cancel out at nodes, which is pretty cool. Anti-nodes are these places where the string moves the most, right? It has the most vibration here. So those are places of maximum amplitude. Now it's kind of a weird thing to talk about the velocity of a standing wave because it's standing, it's not traveling anywhere. So it's hard to think about well, what's its velocity. Um, sometimes people might think, oh, maybe its velocity is how fast the string moves here. But that's not a consistent speed. Like it slows down at the top, it moves as fastest as it goes to the middle. That, that's not a consistent velocity at all. Um, it turns out actually the velocity of a standing wave is actually the velocity of the underlying uh, left traveling and right traveling. So the traveling waves that move this way, move that way. Uh, waves that created the standing wave in the first place. So it's actually really important for a standing wave to have a velocity because our fundamental like wave equation, V is F lambda, still works for standing waves as long as they have a velocity. We can't say their velocity is zero. That makes no sense on this side because they have a frequency and they have a wavelength. Their velocity is just the velocity of the traveling waves that made the standing wave in the first place. Let's look at stringed instruments first. Um, so that's like a guitar, um, it's a stringed instrument, piano, violin, ukulele, all of those. Um, I'll bring a few of these instruments into class and we can play around with them and see how those standing waves work in class. But first I just wanted to give you an overview. So when you just pluck a string, so they say this is a guitar string, I pluck the guitar string, it's going to vibrate the most in the middle of the string and it won't vibrate at all at the ends. So these ends are going to be nodes. So that's a node and that's a node. A node here as well. Will those ends always be nodes? 
Yes, they will always be nodes, and that's because they're literally tied down. The string can't move there. Um, so yes, those ends will always be nodes because the string cannot move at the ends. It's tied down to the um, to the guitar. Um, let's look a little closer here. So this is called the first harmonic. This is how a string will normally vibrate, the standing wave that it sort of adopts, if you just pluck it normally. Um, there's a wavelength in here. Maybe it's a little bit hard to see. So remember a wavelength looks like this. It involves, um, do it in purple here. So it involves an up, back to equilibrium, a down, and back to equilibrium again. So here is equilibrium, and that is one wavelength right there. That's lambda. All right, do we see a lambda here? So here I've got an up, back to equilibrium. What I'm missing is the down and back to equilibrium again. That would make it a full wavelength here. So if you notice when I draw that out, compare the wavelength to the length of the string. So this is the actual just L length of the guitar string. Notice that the wavelength is actually twice as long as the length of the string. And that is true for the first harmonic of any uh, stringed instrument, that lambda is gonna be two times the length of my string. All right. It turns out though the fundamental harmonic or first harmonic is actually not the only harmonic you can make on a guitar string. So I'll have to show you this in class as well. Um, but uh, when you pluck a guitar string, that'll make your sort of first harmonic. But I can actually do some fun techniques that create second harmonics and third harmonics and fourth harmonics. Basically what I'll do is I'm gonna force nodes in various locations on the string um, to create different uh, wave patterns on my string. So this is without changing the tension in the string and without changing the length of the string at all, I can make a whole bunch of different notes on one string. So it's a little bit different than your normal guitar playing, right, where you would fully depress the string. So that would change the length of the string or the effective length of the string by putting your finger down on the string. So that would change the note as well. Harmonics, you're actually keeping the length of the string the same, but you're changing the wave pattern on that string in order to create new notes. It's a really fun way of playing guitar. It has kind of an ethereal sound. Um, you can do this with your voice as well. Um, and that sounds very cool. Um, it's called overtone singing or harmonic singing. And it's uh, where you uh, actually end up, you can create multiple notes, notes in your mouth at once. So you're actually singing multiple different pitches at the same time. Um, by by creating some of these unusual harmonics in your in your like vocal cavity. It's kind of cool. I can't do it very well though, so I won't be able to demonstrate for you, but definitely Google overtone singing and you'll be able to hear some crazy people singing. They're really talented. Okay, so how do we draw the harmonics first? We'll just figure out how to draw them in this video and then in class we'll actually listen to them and see what they look like. Um, okay, first nodes always happen at the ends of strings. Right? The strings tied down, have to have a node there. Every time you go up in a harmonic, you add one extra node your nodes have to be evenly placed. So your first node will be in the middle of the string and then we'll add nodes like two thirds of the way through. Once you've drawn every node, then you just sort of connect the dots with a wave um, and that gives you your harmonics. So I'll just do a few examples here. So here's the first harmonic, it's just a wave like this. The next, the second harmonic, we just add another node and then we make our wave. The third harmonic, keep your nodes at the end and then add two nodes now in the middle. Oh, I didn't evenly space those at all. Let me try that again. Um, nodes at the end, two nodes in the middle, and then connect them with a wave. And, and you just keep going like that. All right. This is what they look like in prettier pictures than I can draw. Um, so these are the first five harmonics. Um, this goes on indefinitely, but they get harder and harder to play. So practically playing more than the fifth harmonic would be really, really tough to do. I'm not a good enough guitar player to do that anyway. Um, let's write down what is the wavelength in uh, relationship to the length of the string for each of these cases. So the length of the string is always just this. That's L. That's the same for all of these pictures. But the wavelength will be different for each of these pictures. So I'll do the wavelength in purple. So here my wavelength, there's an up, there's a down, and back to equilibrium. So we already did this one. Lambda is two times L for the first harmonic. For the second harmonic, here's an up, back to equilibrium. Here's a down, back to equilibrium. Here, lambda is actually equal to L, right? One wavelength was the length of the string. 
For the third harmonic, here's an up back to equilibrium, here's a down back to equilibrium. All right, so here, lambda is less than L, and you can see that my rope is roughly split into thirds here, right? Lambda is two thirds of the length of my string. So it's two of the three thirds. All right, here, an up, a down, back to the middle. You can see lambda is just half of the length of my string, right? There's one wavelength, there's my full length of the string, it's half. And the last one, our fifth harmonic, We've got an up, a down, that's a wavelength right there. There is sort of fifths here, and there's two fifths of them make up that wavelength. So it's lambda is two fifths of my full length of the string. All right, so that's stringed instruments. Let's look at wind instruments. There's actually two kinds of wind instruments. Um, so there's an instrument like a flute, and that's open at both ends. So that means air is free to move at both ends. Um, the two ends of the flute are actually, one is very obvious, it's like the end of the flute. Uh, the other end is the mouthpiece that you're blowing across. And you can actually change that far end of the flute to being wherever sort of the first open hole is. So if, that's a bit confusing. Uh, I'll just draw a quick picture of a flute here. The flute that I own is uh, an Irish flute, so it doesn't have any uh, keys, it makes it a little simpler. There's a mouthpiece here, and then there's a bunch of holes here. My flute actually only has six holes, It's a that's how Irish flutes work. Um, so if so, this is one end of the string here, that's the mouthpiece, or one end of the flute, sorry, not string. Um, the other end of the flute could be here if all the holes are covered. So if my fingers are covering all of these holes, then the end of the flute is here. But if my finger's only covering maybe some of the holes, then the end of the flute is the first open hole. So maybe that one there. So the end of the flute changes depending on where your fingers are, and that's one of the ways that you make different notes on the flute. But it's not the only way. You can also make different notes on a flute using harmonics. So first, let's look at those open ends, which wherever our open ends are. Are they nodes or antinodes for the movement of air particles? These are going to be antinodes, so that's points of maximum movement of air particles. And that's because at an open end, the air is able to move as much as it wants there. Um, so, because air is free to move. So this is totally the opposite, right, of a string which is tied down at the end. An open end of a flute, air is free to move anywhere it wants. Um, so that means our harmonics in a flute are going to look a little bit different. So we're going to get antinodes at the ends of the flute here. Um, so when you're drawing uh, your standing waves for a flute, you're going to want to start by putting actually a node in the middle and antinodes at the end for your first harmonic. Let's see if we can figure out for um, the different harmonics. So this is your first harmonic. This is the second the third, the fourth, and so on, for flute, um, or any any uh, wind instrument that has uh, two open ends. Um, let's try and figure out how the wavelength is related to the length of the flute for each of these. Um, so here, a, a wavelength, if we're, if we're doing a wavelength starting at an antinode, right, in general a wave is kind of like this, right, it goes up, down, back to the middle again. If I do another wave, it go up, down, back to the middle again. If I want to measure a wavelength from an antinode, that would mean starting here, going down to the deepest trough, and up to the next antinode. So that is one lambda. That's what I'm looking to measure here. So here's my length of the flute. That's L. If I want to draw lambda, I would start at an antinode here, go down through the equilibrium, go down to the lowest trough, I have to go up through equilibrium again, and up to the next um, uh, antinode, the next highest crest here, and that would be a full, um, a full wavelength. So what you'll notice is that lambda is two times the length of the string, or length of the flute, here as well. For the second harmonic, I start at a crest, down to the trough, up to the next crest, that's all of lambda, that's also the length of my flute. So lambda is just equal to the length of my flute. You may notice a pattern here. This is exactly the same as the relationships for stringed instruments. Even though we start antinode, it still works the same way. So uh, antinode down to crest, up, or down to trough, up to the next crest. You can see if I split this, this is split into thirds. So my lambda is two thirds 
of the length. And for the fourth harmonic, we'll stop there on the flute here. It's very hard to play higher than fourth harmonic. I certainly don't have that skill. I could split this up like this. You can see here that the wavelength is half of the length. So in a flute, how you get from the first harmonic to the second harmonic basically is you just blow harder. Um, and if you've ever played a wind instrument, you've experienced that, right? If you want to jump into the sort of the next octave up, just blow harder, keep your finger in exactly the same, and the note you'll produce will be an octave higher. Um, I, I can't even make third harmonics, but uh, if you blew really hard, maybe you could do that. Um, I'm not a great flute player. Okay, so some instruments are open at one end and closed at another end. So an example of that is the clarinet. That's where you're using a reed to blow into it. So your mouth is like sealing over the reed. That makes a closed end. But the other end of your clarinet is um, open to the air. So that's an open end. So the open end will still be, so open end is still gonna be an anti-node, just like before. But the closed end is gonna be a node. And that's because the air can move the, the least there, right, at the point where um, it's sealed off and, and closed. So our pictures will look a little bit different for wind instruments that are closed at one end, like the clarinet. So this is kind of what a clarinet would look like. So this, this end here would be the mouthpiece, and this end is the, uh, the end that's like open to, to the air. Um, so here I'm going to have a node at the one end, that's, uh, that's the mouthpiece end, and an anti-node at the other end. Um, let's see if we can figure out how the wavelength is related here. So right in general, if I start at an anti-node, my wavelength should go down to equilibrium, down to a trough, up to equilibrium again, and then up to the next crest. And that would be a whole wavelength. So here my wavelength comes from the crest, down to equilibrium. From there it has to go down to the trough, up to equilibrium, and keep going up to the next crest, and that's a full wavelength. So it barely fits on my page here. You can see that lambda is actually four times the length of your, your flute there, or your, um, your clarinet there. Okay, here's another one. So these ones I think are the, the trickiest. Um, so notice I can split this here, like that. I have a, a crest down to equilibrium down to a trough, up to equilibrium. I'm not actually at a full wavelength yet until I go up to the next crest. So my lambda here is actually going to be four thirds. So see how my length, I could split into thirds. I add another third on there, make four thirds of the length and that gives me my full wavelength. Right, here's one, I've got a crest, down to equilibrium, down to a trough, up to equilibrium, up to the next crest. That is a wavelength, so if I split up the length of the my, uh, clarinet, it splits into fifths there, one, two, three, four, five. Um, so lambda here is four fifths of the length of my, my clarinet. Um, I should label these, by the way, this is the first harmonic, this is the second, this is the third, and this is the fourth harmonic. Let's do our very last one, so crest, equilibrium, trough, equilibrium, crest. I'll split this up. It splits into seven pieces. So lambda is four sevenths of the length. Right? Four sevenths is how far from my wavelength. All right, we're going to do some problem solving with this in class, but that's just an introduction to how harmonics work with wind and stringed instruments.